and we are good. Good evening, everyone, and welcome once again to the Writer's Room. I'm your host, Kat Rocha, the night editor, and our guest this evening is Kit, Ch Kit Sun Chi. I am so sorry, I think I just slaughtered your name. Uh, but uh, today, this evening, my co-hosts are... Jay Ishiro Finney, author and alien in a human suit. One rather uh, overworked Florida woman. Hello. And with us is Kitson Chi. Yes. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming. Now, a little backstory. Uh, it says here that uh, he's uh, Singapore's first Hugo and Dragon Award nominated science fiction and fantasy writer. Um, that he wanted to be an astronaut, a magician, and an inventor, but settled for being a writer, which is kind of like being all three. <laughs> and that he has published a ton of different stuff with independent presses and all of them are available on the links in the description oh hey buddy lord just arrived we, just in time hello hello dr raptor or professor raptor yeah i'm uh, gonna go grab the, some more links to put in the chat so that way everybody can quite possibly support people by buying some really good books. In fact, I love studying other people's writing styles because now I know what to look for. Yay! All right, Kit Sun, why don't you just give the audience a bit of a description of yourself and what you do? Hmm. I write science fiction and fantasy. I cover all kinds of genres from cyberpunk to anti-lit RPG, and now I'm working on the cultivation series. I've been writing professionally for the past seven, almost eight years now. And I published about 15 books or so, with six more on the way. What about two books a year? Mm, it used to be two books a year. Now I'm wrapping it up. Right. It, <laughs> this year, yeah, this year alone I published something like, I believe it's seven books. Oh my god. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he's really got it down pat. Woohoo! They're like the anti George R. R. Martin. That's what we're <laughs> you can see that, yeah. And a couple things. Uh, he seems to be the inventor of the anti lit RPG genre. Uh, explain to the audience what that means. Well, a lit RPG is a genre in which the story is told as if it's in the world that runs on RPG mechanics. So you've got stat screens, you've got stats, you've got characters leveling up, you get HP, MP, EXP, and all the Ps you can have at once. <laughs> and then just summarize, I want to do the exact opposite. No stat screens, no leveling up, no arbitrary skills, abilities, or whatnot. So and just at a the story. Same, yeah, at the same time, though, it is still inspired by RPG tropes. The whole series is essentially one ultra long dungeon crawl from start to finish. Hmm. It's their boss monsters. They still have desperate fights. There's still magic or skills or prayers. You can see the RPG influences if you look hard enough. But it's not bogged down by stats. It's not a game world. It's not driven by a desire to cram a CRPG into the written word, into the page, so to speak. Yeah, I never quite understood the obsession with um, having stat sheets for a story when you know, you, you've got the story there. On the other hand, the concept of using game mechanics as a story premise can be done interestingly. I mean, most recently we had Free Guy, uh, but then there's also been Gantz and All You Need Is Kill, which both applied uh, gaming concepts to reality and kind of showed it to be an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of JRPG readers are gamers. They play JRPGs, they play C Western company real playing games. And even a few also play old-fashioned tabletop RPGs. 
they are used to seeing stat screens. They love stat screens. And they know that the whole point of the gameplay is to level up your characters and go on even grand adventures. So the game lit slash the RPG draw speaks to that audience. They present them something familiar with. It creates mm-hmm. an instant connection. And then they can immerse themselves more deeply into the plot. Or so the thinking goes. Yeah, I was always of the mind that you didn't need to tell the audience how many points of damage. You could just say, you know, the nine millimeter took his uh, uh, spray of nine millimeter bullets, took the guy's arm off, is already kind of message enough he's screwed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I some games have that. The, the, okay, like originally the stats and everything were because like the original systems were not role playing games, they were strategy games. That's even how, like, the military, like, different militaries of the world actually uh, use D&D, but they don't use, like, the RPG aspect of it. They use the strategy of it. They use the one from, you know, the Red Book or whatever. Mm. You know, the one that, that, like, Gygax actually created, which was, you know, I mean, they, they began to create stories for their little soldiers, but at first it was just strategy. And so, I mean, that was the, the implement of RPG was really just taking something like Tolkien, right, the war, the huge war and saying almost saying like okay this entire that's why the characters were were so robust because it was really like one character represented like a hundred people you know so they were trying to have like one person represent kind of everything that race was or or that person was that's why you had in the original i don't know if you ever played it but you had like they didn't have like dwarven something it was dwarf (laughs) yeah i recall that Mm -hmm. wizard you know very basic um and i think really what they discovered was that people just love gambling. So, <laughs> I mean, it's really what it is. It's voluntary gambling with no money. You know, what you win is dopamine. <laughs> hmm. So, I mean, wh- what you're essentially saying is, is, is kind of interesting is that we're taking the low effort, low uh, risk reward system and making it. Uh, I don't know, like you're taking the gambling out of it and making it more of just a story, a collective story, which I mean, I don't know, that's they're probably be more akin to like a camp, like, like a campsite fire trail kind of thing. Or I don't know, what was, what, I never played it, but uh, being goth, I'm sure you were indoctrinated in these kind of things. What was the whole White Wolf scene like? That was Cat's World. I played Cyberpunk. <laughs> That was Cat's World. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I really didn't have much interest in Vampire. Cat, you talk about it. Um, vampire really wasn't about stats too much. I mean, you're always going to have your uh, power gamers. Um, but uh, it was really more about the role playing to the point of uh, San Diego was just overrun with LARPers. <laughs> so. I remember going to a convention one time, a comic, a small comic book convention at a hotel. Uh, like lobby, you know, one of their mm-hmm. little meeting areas, and they had all these, these, like, mostly boys running around with like their arms crossed. Yep. And I think oh, they were God. supposed to be invisible. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That. And and there were a couple of of us comic and MTG nerds that took no small amount of delight running in front of them and going, "I see you," and then running away. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so Kit's son here is, is pioneered the anti lit mm-hmm. RPG, which I'm all for just because it's anti. Yes. <laughs> and I would believe Fiona probably feels similar. Would, th- would that be correct? Florida woman? I don't oh, think she's, she's muted. Fiona. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. Because I'm busy trying to link more things so we can promote his books. But no, I, I honestly, yeah, because most lit RPG has a very specific kind of protagonist. And he doesn't dance with that tune. Which is like, thank God. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, so it's, oh, so it's like his books are anti lit RPG. Yeah, because yeah, lit RPG loves to take kind of like that blank slate kind of hero in some cases, but they're not really heroic per se. You know, not in the traditional sense. It, it's more like it's the dregs of society gets stuck in no game. Yeah, like uh, wish fulfillment. Yeah, 
and that's why I appreciate his books and Yakov's books going a more of a, a little bit more of an isekai route where they're they're taking a, a protagonist or a set of characters that actually had some purpose in the regular world before they get stuck somewhere else. You know, they actually had a decent life or decent morals or decent values before they get whisked off somewhere for an adventure. Uh, Kitsan, can you tell us about the series that uh, Fiona was bringing up? Dungeon Samurai was written specific with one specific goal in mind. A story arc that should progress off a shonen to a samurai. That is, young Japanese men to become a warrior. Now, in most, like what they're not saying, mostly RPGs, you have a blank slate hero. The idea being that the reader can more easily pour himself into the character. And I didn't want that approach. I felt it was extremely low effort and honestly, it was pretty bland. If the hero, if no, if the hero has no personality, then he is, then he's nothing. He has no reason for people to like him, no reason for people to support him, no f reason for him to do anything at all, really. So, with Yamada Yuki, the protagonist of Tetris Samurai, I wanted an ordinary Japanese male. He's 18 years old, he's in first year of Tokyo University, and he's living a, an extremely ordinary life, save for one slight difference. He studies the classical Japanese martial art of Kokishin Ryu alongside his best friend Hiroshi. So when the demon of Danji Samurai, the main antagonist, whisks everyone off in a dojo off to a hell world, Yamana Yuki already knows how to take care of himself as do everyone in the dojo. Contrast this with the RPG protagonists who A, have no skills whatsoever, or B, allegedly have skills but don't actually show those skills. And so these the RPG protagonists learn their skills through, well, arbitrary leveling up systems or so-called training or whatnot. And they didn't want that. In real life, it takes months, even years, to learn how to fight competently. If we tried doing it for Dungeon Samurai, we're stuck in volume one for it. Who knows how long. So I wanted to make the protagonist competent from the start. They may not be masters of the art, but at least they know that they care themselves. Which is step above from other late RPG protagonists. And so, Yamada and his fellow Isekai protagonists are drafted into an army to to conquer the Tatiola dungeon. They form up into squads, they form they lead expeditions in the dungeon, they fight monsters, they employ the military training and skills, and they battle boss monsters and lock lower floors. And so they march all they fight all the way to the bottom and endure sea. Traps, gas, horrors, like magic, and pretty much everything the demon that runs the dungeon can throw at them. So I think D and D both an ultra sadistic dungeon master. All right. Um, Humble Marty in the chat uh, brings up uh, Blake's blank slate hero, and a lit RPG protagonist is basically Bella from Twilight. <laughs> Um, um, and I take it you do not write blank slate heroes. I don't. Actually, oh. Bella from Twilight is better than the average protagonist. Ouch. Wow. <laughs> wow. She has personality. You know? <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> but no, no, he... what? Oh, no. What is Bella's personality? <laughs> oh, God. Exactly. But... She is Bella. Oh, but I, I could definitely tell you, yeah, he does take a lot of different types of character archetypes and does different things. With like, take uh, Heroes Unleashed, for example. That has a family angle that I'm highly interested in. And half the time people, if they use that angle in most books, it, it 
it's like how you would expect it. Like, oh, somebody's been captured. But no, this is like more, a little bit more of dynamics of what's happening in that city, you know, as to not like give anything away about the books. But yeah, I appreciated that. It was like it had more of like a, a family and drama movie. angle to it that you would expect out of something like maybe like Blue Bloods, you know. But in a superhero setting, like how would a cop's job change in a superhero setting, you know? Kit Sun, um, you're also involved with a Silver Empire's superhero series, right? Yes. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Heroes Unleashed is a shared superhero project by Silver Empire. So we have a common setting. We have superheroes from all across the setting. And every now and then, they interact with each other. So, for example, we can have a superhero in one series, make a guest appearance in another series, as super villains as well. For my contribution, it, the, the series is titled Song of Karma. It's about Adam Song, a police officer in, Hollow, in Halo City, who wakes up one day to, and learns he has superpowers, the ability to amplify his natural speed, strength, stamina, vision, and so on and so forth. Although he can only amplify one aspect of biology at a time. Adam Song is, or was, a by the book cop. So after discovering superpowers, the first thing he does is form superiors, and he decides to volunteer for the department star team, which is basically the SWAT team. But as steroids. One day, he is, his team is tasked with conducting a high risk warrant. They found a supervillain and his crew who specialize in assassination and drive by shootings. So the mission is to take them all down. Which the team does, except that Adam is forced to shoot the supervillain and his girlfriend. And the supervillain in question is the son of a major drug lord. And that sparks it, a series of unfortunate events, shall we say? Yes, um. <laughs> to put it mildly, <laughs> yes, um. I get it. I take it we've already got the uh, Fiona approval of this book. Well, yeah, half the time, in order for me to, like, be like, oh, what kind of wheelhouse is this? You go, you hit me through the my primary wheelhouse of either superheroes or pew pew or general science fiction, and it's just like, okay, I'm going to take a look at this other work. Oh, wait, ah, this is pretty decent, even though it, it's not my usual cup of tea. But hey, you, you can't learn how to do new things if you don't at least give a few other genres a try. Well, well, Fiona, you like the book? You've read it. The man is here. Ask him a question. Hmm. How, how many books do you think you'll end up doing for Silver Empire over there? Because I know they want to come out with more Heroes Unleashed stuff. And I'll be there to buy the hardback copies. I even gifted my brother a copy or two. Thank you. Well, Heroes Unleashed, well, my contribution to Heroes Unleashed is planned to run for five books. Nice. <laughs> I'll be sure to buy them more with credits. That's why I saved the, all, all those credits. It's like, yes. And, and believe me, you could take some of some of your books and be like, it's right up there with some wither in terms of thickness. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, a little bit earlier, uh, you were talking a little bit about uh, politics and being in Singapore. Or is that okay to talk about? Sure. Now, as you said, your parents were a little nervous about you touching on things. Can you get into that? Uh, I suppose a lot of that has to do with Singapore's history. First, we, Singapore was just colonized by the British in 1819, and things were pretty peaceful until the Japanese invaded in 1942. And after that, we saw the rise of nationalist movements starting in 1940s. Five right after the Japanese retreat, a withdrawal from Singapore and a surrender. Along came multiple politicians, chiefly Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew became the father of Singapore. 
And although he did raise Singapore from, in his words, a fishing village to a first world city, he did have an extremely authoritarian leadership style. In so many terms, anyone who opposed him would find himself facing the full might of the law. The socialists, for example, were arrested in one swoop. My father used to live across the street from the Barisan Socialist headquarters. And so it was a night of the night, the police would raid the headquarters of the Barisan Socialists. And for a, big, a long period, I think, from the, the mid-70s to the early 90s, there was a period where there was no opposition in parliament at all. Not a single one. There was an environment the older generation grew up in. As of my generation, I grew up in a time where the opposition has made some headway, where the government has loosened its restrictions somewhat, where the government doesn't necessarily arrest people for speaking, for speaking against them. The government doesn't raid opposition parties anymore. But in spite of that, they still stick to the old ways. Government maintains an, a narrative that encompasses the founding myths of Singapore, racial and religious harmony, transparency, meritocracy. Anyone who opposes this myth will find themselves at the end of a, hit, of a, hit, of a smear campaign, if you will. At least that's in American slang, yeah? Yeah. So you yeah. have politicians criticizing them. If you say the wrong, wrong word, they'll be sued in court. Anything that can interpret as criminal defamation will lead to arrest and trials in court. So this environment we live in today. Okay. So and lately, the, well, only if you grow in the older generation, I suppose. Ah. In my case, I've been studying the law. I've been looking at where, exactly where the other bonds markets lie. Man, I don't even want to know what the vaccination junk is going on over there. If it's if it's as nutty as it is over here, or more so. Oh man, oh, because depending on the business or whatever, they either want people all vaxxed or show your passport. It's like, oh no. Blech. I was trying to make give him a wrench. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I hit the wrong button. Jeez. <laughs> Technology is against us. I was trying to give Fizz Chozo a wrench so he could patrol uh, the uh, chat, but never mind. But anyway, continue. Mm hmm Oh, boy. Oh. Yeah, because every once in a while when I see you going on a little story on some bird site, I'm like, oh, wow. Like, I thought our mainstream media and stuff was bad here in the U.S. Ugh. No, I've been to China. <laughs> and I've been to, I mean, I've been to Iran, China, Israel, I've been to other countries, uh, the Middle East, and some places <clears throat> in Africa, like Egypt. Uh, I don't know. Like, wh whenever I hear people complain about America and freedoms and stuff, I'm like, have you been outside America? Because I don't think so. <laughs> no, so even I wasn't outside of America during my time in the Navy, I was in CONUS the whole time. So I was going to say is uh, cyberpunk author William Gibson did an article in the 90s about Singapore in which he described it as Disneyland with a death penalty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that fair? Disneyland is supposed to be fun. <laughs> oh, God. Wow. But only for the visitors. Yep. I think though what it's really referring to there is it's it's more like Disneyland. He's like it's a theme park. Yeah. You know, like it's a wild ride, but um, I wouldn't want to live here. You know. <laughs> you could say that. But you said you'd made your choices, and you said what you said, and you're not worried about it. Is that correct? Yep. Well, what is that to say? 
I cannot unspeak what I've spoken. I cannot unwrite what I have written. And I've been operating within the law. And a law for 15 years, I found nothing they can, they can hammer me with. And even though late last month, well, technically only this month, I think, mm -hmm. the government issued me with a correction direction for a blog because they want to get the correct facts across. That's pretty much the, ex the full extent of my involvement with the government. Okay. Well, if you ever need to flee, Arizona is a great place to come to. You don't wear masks, no vac vac passports, and, and we get to own guns, so you're welcome. <laughs> welcome to join us here if it ever gets bad. Mm -hmm. Has, oh, <laughs> do you put um, what you have seen or experienced in your writing, or do you try to keep those things separate? Hmm. It's got to be there. As, as, as like, I was looking over your, your Twitter and as, as much as you're into uh, politics and just freedom and the understanding of uh, compliance, complacency. And, you know, what, what was that that quote you had? It was really good. Freedom is the hook. They, they, they dangle yeah, for you that. to be compliant, basically. Um, yep. You know, that was that's really good. I like that. And Thank you. That's absolutely true. You know, it reminds me of the uh, the C.S. Lewis quote that there's there's no more sinister an action than someone who is doing something for your good, because they'll never stop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When writing my fiction, I tried to make things universal because mm -hmm. I'm not writing for a Singaporean audience. I'm writing for a global audience, mm -hmm. or more specifically, an American audience. So. so you Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is try to keep things relatable for the target audience. With Heroes Unleashed in particular, it's written around a time like George Floyd, trials and riots, and as well as Antifa and Black Lives Matter. So, and I've realized that if there was real life superheroes, we'd see something similar. And we will also see the same, something similar to the Martin King rap, the, the riots in 1991 in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So for my other series like Babylon, mm -hmm. that was more universalized. In the Babylon series, we have, yep, that. There are seven groups of arch demons struggling for control of the world. Our heroes are a group of elite operators who are trying to prevent just that. These seven arch demons pose as gods and call themselves the new gods. They control the corporations, the media, the government, everything. And the only reason they haven't controlled the world yet is because they're busy fighting each other. And they're all too evenly matched. There, there was meant to be a more universal approach and arguably a more fantasy approach. As for my other cyberpunk series, Singularity Sunrise, they're somewhat speculative. Yeah, Singularity Sunrise is based on the, the idea of this technological singularity a time of runaway technological change. A trigger for this is an artificial general intelligence, an AI so powerful that it can make recursive self-improvements, so become even smarter by the day, so to speak. This was from a philosophical to political, political. Is this like, a, a, was it Laplace's demon kind of thing? Not exactly. Do you guys it's, understand? You know Laplace's demon? You ever heard that? I've heard of them, yeah. No, I was, oh, I'm sorry. Ish, like, basically, it's, it's just a computer that can that if you could predict the future, then you could also predict the past. You'd be able oh, to the basilisk it. thing. That's uh, yeah. yeah. That's pretty silly. In the case of Singularity Sunrise, the AI is an ultra intelligent being 
that can be, make yourself even more intelligent and introduce even more breakthrough technologies at rapid pace. Mm. In one instance, for example, one technology is introduced in book four. A few months later, it can reproduce that technology perfectly. For technology that could take humans decades to develop. So for simple narrative summarization, more, like I say, it's more philosophical. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it does pose the question of how people use technology and why. Kind of reminds me of uh, some of the um, the sentiments of Bicentennial Man. Mm. Wherein, uh, because he's like a robot that, you know, he, he starts off as like an android robot or whatever, but then he falls in love with his owner's daughter and he wants to be human. So he begins to create parts that could go both ways. And in the creation of parts and understanding, he, you know, they're like, oh, he, you know, the whole idea is that, is that like, you know, how does a robot, I mean, it's such a, uh, an interesting question. You know, in that in that case, you know, how does it become more human? Because what you're you're sort of getting at is that the technology is becoming more human than humans. You know, it, it begins to become more like you're saying. I mean, because what is it? Uh, the the integration of, of technology is like uh, every uh, every 17 years we take a leap of, of twofold or something like, or 12 years we take a leap twofold. And but the uh, our our humanities have not developed for 1,200 years. Mm -hmm. In the case of Singularity Sunrise, the AI here is a super intelligent computer, but at the same time, it's trying to be more human as well. It believes it's created to serve humans, but has no idea how to be human. Mm -hmm. So the human protagonist's job is to teach it how to be human. Okay. If only so that it won't unleash a computer apocalypse on the world. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does that come? How do, how would you teach a machine to be human? Ah, that's an interesting part, isn't it? And that's what the protagonist, James Morgan, has to struggle with throughout the series. The thing you understand about this AI is that it does not respond to human emotions at all. It thinks only in terms of logic. There's no conception of human emotions. It doesn't even feel emotions. And so James Morgan has to appeal to his sense of logic. And that leads him down paths of philosophy. He has to, he, he quotes ancient philosophers. He has to introduce the AI to ideas from the, from the philosophers of previous ages. He wants to show the AI how humans think and how humans feel and how humans see the world. Well, the interesting thing about that concept is uh, the vast majority of our emotions, as I understand, are more chemical. And things like aggression, uh, drive, pretty much when you remove uh, something as simple as if you remove testosterone completely from a person, they kind of just close off and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Mm -hmm. Your brain is degenerative which means that if any part of it stops functioning, for the most part, other parts can take over for that and supersede or impose a similar ability. Now, where this doesn't work, though, is things like, because like uh, what you're actually, where that doesn't work is, is things like um, uh, Parkinson's. Parkinson's is, you know, one of the major things of Parkinson's is, is not having uh, your basically your dopamine doesn't recreate. So because it doesn't complete, you just they, they keep doing something. They're stuck in a, in a loop of something. And so you know one of the things to that is obviously to, you know like to uh, to help you know to to have like a dopamine drip or or to have something like that because your brain can't replicate that. But I get it is like if you lose say like your like if you were to lose part like function of your uh, say your pfc your, your prefrontal cortex your acc and ras can actually take o can take over some of that functionality like if you're you get an actual like physical brain damage the rest of your brain will actually pick it up will, will uh, you know pick up the slack and do something what's i think interesting though is that it would almost be like it, it'd be it's it's like learning another 
it's learning another language, but like that on steroids, you know? We're going to cut they, shut down. Huh? Well, we're going to shut down a few of your logic circuits, Sal, and see what exactly. happens. Will I exactly. bring Dr. Chandra? Yeah, you know, and I mean, like the neuroplasticity that it would take to be able to do something like that is pretty nuts. Um, you know, to be able to think like, like you're saying, like you'd have to shut your emotions down in order to think completely logically so that you could talk to them in their language so that you could then get them to feel <laughs> or get it to feel. So, Kitsan, how do you handle this? Hmm. With great care. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I did study human biochemistry for those scenes. In the case of the AGF, for example, I gave it the ability to simulate human emotions through feedback loops. Mm -hmm. Pseudo emotions, so to speak. Got programs that register to it as emotions, be it pleasure or sadness or whatever, you have, what have you. And these feedback loops drive the AI's behavior. With James Morgan, the protagonist, he has undergone lots of training to remain calm. He practices. Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, a Japanese martial art, which, for, which requires the practitioner to develop inner peace. He meditates a lot as well for his regular work. So that's about as close to pure logic as, as a human could get anyway. Yeah. So when it's time to speak to the AI, he knows how to calm himself instantly. He, know, he, he knows how to remind himself that he is not speaking with a human and he cannot use Human, the common sense of humans, so to speak, mm. and speaking to an AI. Now he's still in the human world, right? Like, like if he leaves his partner or whatever this thing is, and then he goes and talks to like somebody else, he, he wants to go on a date, starts talking to a girl. How's that work? Has he got to shut that part of himself off? Uh, he's not linked to the AI, actually. The AI either calls him, or it downloads itself into a cyborg body to interact okay. with him. So Morgan just goes off to live his life, but whenever they work together, you have instances where they talk about higher things, the meaning of life, mm -hmm. beauty, reason, what makes people human, and so on and so forth. Gotcha, gotcha. Is uh, this like, you know, you know other, other uh, uh, writers have uh, explored this area, and there's, there's tons of room to explore. But for somebody who's looking for this type of story, would you consider yourself like in an Asimov camp or a Philip K. Dick camp? Or is there a, a type of uh, science fiction author like like neuromancer of william gibson camp is there something that you can liken how you are depicting your ais to mm. personally i'll favor ghost in the shell oh good choice uh shiro or or um uh, oshi. or oshi the both the manga and the anime franchise all right very good choice. Uh, and where does the action fit into all this? Because, you know, here we got the cover and we've got two badasses with guns. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really say AI. So what's the action aspect? James Morgan's day job is as private military contractor. In other words, mercenary. Not only that, he has psychic powers. So he actually plays a support role. His company's he is tasked with resolving difficult situations. In other words, black ops. Although the the official job is mostly private security and stuff. Hey man, you know that kind of definition that could be babysitting, you know? <laughs> yeah. In the world of Sing Directly Sunrise, we got factions trying to use virtual technologies for their own ends, such as terrorist groups nation states and other such bad actors 
the hero's job is to resolve incidents before they arise or to neutralize threats to the employers, which in this case is the AI and the company that created it. In the book you're looking at, the Silicon Road in particular, the client is Anatole Corporation, the megacorp that created the AGI. Anatole wants to move into North Africa. It sees opportunities to West Africa. It sees opportunities to expand into a new market. But once they arrive, the Anatole team comes under fire by criminals and thugs. So now it's up to James Morgan and his team to figure out why and to neutralize the threat at the source. And what you're looking at, by the way, is James Morgan on the right and his partner, Maya Knight, on the left. Very cool. Um, so is there any other titles of yours that you would like to uh, tell the audience about? My current series is Saga the Swordbreaker. It's currently being crowdfunded on Indiegogo. Saga the Swordbreaker is a cyberpunk cultivation series. Think Final Fantasy VII. Mix Usia. Okay. Did you say cyberpunk cultivation? Yep. Okay. What does that mean? With cultivation, we have tropes from Uxia and Xianxia. We have characters who practice martial arts. Okay. Who practice, and they also practice cultivation. Think Qigong, drinking special potions and other stuff to increase their chi. And with that chi, they can use magic. Oh, so like a like a different way that they say like progression kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. For the cyberpunk element, we have technology. It's actually, unlike other cultivation series, this is actually set in a high-tech world. We've got plasma guns, airships, the internet, smart glasses. We also have mega corporations. The whole series is set in the continent of Seattle which is divided into five main countries. However, the five states are in turn dominated by the 10 corporations. The 10 megacorps that run the environmental industries of the, the entire continent. The 10 corporations run the show everywhere. The governments are just there to be enforcers and to run day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. Our hero, Li Ming, is a young man who wants to enter the Jianghu to pursue dreams of wealth and glory. Mm -hmm. The ultimate goal for everyone who enters the Jianghu is immortality, which in the world of this sawbreaker is regular ultra expensive treatments to first develop longevity, then to arrest aging, and finally to reverse the aging process. The catch is so expensive that only the ultra elite can afford more than one longevity treatment in their lifetimes. And so to get there, you need to be a celebrity. You need to earn millions of dollars every year to afford that. Okay. Or you have to be sponsored by a government or corporation. Millions so of dollars compared to what? Millions of what? Like millions of dollars compared to like I mean with inflation and everything I mean obviously it changes so I'm just thinking like is a million bucks like just is that like just a crap ton of money is it like a million dollars like now like in the 80s like in the 60s or in current terms okay so the really easiest... really expensive <gasps> yeah what if they <laughs> try to buy it at NTFs <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yes or whatever it's called because because Florida woman doesn't understand the fake money. Enough to make real money from fake money. To make more <laughs> fake money from real money. Wait, what kind of minus stuff is this? <laughs> well, 
In Saga the Swordbreaker, the easiest way to become an immortal is to work for one of the ten corporations or the five gov- or the five states. And Li Ming realizes that the price of working for the ten corporations may be too steep for his soul. <laughs> so like the journey west is to make money, yo. <laughs> hmm. First, he makes money. He wants to make money, but then he realizes that he's on the wrong path. He sees exactly where the mindset leads him, and everyone caught in it. And what are some of the things that people can get in on if they uh, donate or uh, back the Indiegogo? At the lowest level, they can get the ebook version and the print version of the series. At the higher tiers, you can get copies of my other books as well. Dungeon Samurai, Babylon, Singapore Sunrise, etc. etc. At the topmost tiers, you can even book a master class with me to learn the art of writing. Nice. That's really nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how long do you think this series will go on? Six books. Oh, you've got that all mapped out? Yep. Pope speed! I must want to be yeah. like, how many pages? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, uh, each book runs to about 100 to 120k words. Jeez. I- I'm telling you, <laughs> there's a reason why he's notable. For like, Pope do you Pope? have to replace the membrane on your typing? On your keyboard? <laughs> <laughs> For what it's worth, some of my keys have lost their quotes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not surprising. <laughs> What's a typical day for you? Hmm. Wake up, get breakfast, and work. Then lunch, then work, then dinner, and then emails and other stuff. So it's pretty boring, yeah. really. When's the martial arts fit in? In Second Assault Breaker, well, they, they all, everyone operates in the Jianghu, the world of rivers and lakes. And with the Jianghu, you must have martial arts. So everyone who's part of Jianghu practices martial arts. I think he means you. When do you fit martial arts in? In the five scenes and also in cultivation. No, what, like not well, in personally. the book. In your life. In my life. <laughs> No, you right. do martial arts, right? Yep. Mm. Cultivation comes in in the morning after we wake up. Qigong. And then martial arts training in the evening before dinner. So altogether it's about 90 minutes of training every day. So, see, he, like, he's focused on martial arts. He gets it done in six pages. George obviously focused on the food and the buffet lines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. And I, and I think that George had a lot of practice. Yeah. yeah. When it came to writing food, he practiced and researched. <laughs> he, he is really practicing on them buffet lines. <laughs> but no, right. I'm going to be sure to get in on that Indiegogo. I, I just have to strategically wait for one more bill to get out of the way and to be like, I'm going to go back that Indiegogo <laughs> before Thank it you. runs out. Yes. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Fiona is, is a, a very ardent fan yes. of indie yes. books. And yeah, yes. Uh, I will, pr- I will promptly showcase all the alternatives to mainstream skin suits it's like, please, there's so many people out here trying to try to do their best and, and kicking the pants off of Hollywood and please give them the time of day. Even five minutes, please. <laughs> All right. Well, we are down to roughly the last 10 minutes of the show. Mm-hmm. So I guess this is the promotion part. Yes. Uh, let's get the guests go first. I know we already kind of talked about it, but any last minute promoting you want to recommend people check out? Hmm. Well, if you want to learn the art of writing, I can recommend Pulp on Pulp. Pulp on Pulp is a collection of essays edited by myself and Michelle Burnett. 
Okay. We gathered a bunch of indie writers and asked them to share the tricks of the trade. So we've got everything from genre analysis to how to write quickly to how to write heroes and villains. Do you have anything on so Gumroad? No, not Gumroad. Um, so, and as far as anyone who's not familiar with your work, what's a good starting book for someone who wants to get into Kitsunchi? Hmm. Well, if you want the fantasy side, I recommend Dungeon Samurai. If you want the science fiction side, I'll say Babylon. I've been reading the, I, I was reading Babylon Red today and quite impressed with the style. Thank you. I liked the integration of the uh, uh, augmented reality with that out actually being over the top. It's just there. Mm -hmm. That's high Which praise. Thank you. Um, all right. And uh, I guess, again, then if you're into superheroes, there's the stuff you've done with Silver Empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's written under Kawai Chiado. Okay. So if you want superheroes, look for Song of Karma under Kai Wechia, published by Silver Empire. I'll get a link for that in a minute. Who wants to go next? I guess I will. Everybody knows me. I'm just the crazy lady that likes pew pew and space opera and space fantasy. So if you want that mixed in with, with a tiny bit of superhero work of aspirational stuff of old then give uh, the Uplift Protocol a try. Soon to be regularly published after I get all 13 books done, which eat your heart out, heart out Martin. I'm going to get to do seven in this upcoming year. I, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to catch up. I'm trying to get that pump speed, yo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the point when you actually published your finished book and we bring you on for the interview. Mm -hmm. I, it'll be I know, same. right? Like, if she's excited about other people's books, she's probably, I don't know, man. I'm super excited about mine because I, I, I love commissioning artwork for it to put in the book because, yeah, I like that element in the old pulps where they used to have artwork, uh, like internal artwork with certain scenes. Oh, I that love was that. always fun. Um. By the way, everything we're mentioning right now is is linked in the description, by the way. Uh, buddy? I am the author of Sins of the Fae, and you can go to sinsofthefae.com or bladenight.com and find that. If you want uh, a world where pretty much everything exists, you know, all that cool stuff, cosmic horror uh, which, uh, you know, I don't know, which converted energy into electrical mechanical robots, <laughs> uh, sea creatures, gods coming down to earth and visiting their devastation and punishment upon humans. And then the Fae and the, and the people and the dragons and everything coming together to, to uh, stand as one in a final epic battle. Then you'll love Sins of the Fae. And again, that is linked in the description. Mm -hmm. And you said a light novel is going to be coming out too. Yeah, the light novel. Like I've been, uh, it's been so aggravating. I finally, I've got. I, I had somebody. He's been editing it, and I thought he was going to edit it in like you know a week, and he's still editing it. Okay. <laughs> and it's not even that big, so it's kind of annoying. But it's Christmas, so I'm giving him that, and then I'm gonna start getting mad. <laughs> All right, and I guess finally, uh, I could promote one of my books, I suppose, but instead, I'm going to recommend everyone go over to my website and start following me there. Mm -hmm. Jay Ishiro Finney, author and alien in a human suit, right there. And what you'll find there is regular reviews posted on a weekly basis or articles, uh, basically links and previews to all of my books, including the comics, and the audio drama. So if you want to hear readings of the books, they're on there as well. And then there's a lot of fun extras. So that's my recommendation. And finally, the editor of Zero One Publishing. What do you have to say at this this holiday season of Christmas and, and trees and love and all that? Oh, um, well, uh, I'm going to promote 
Well, zero one publishing. Uh, the number zero, the number one publishing dot com. Um, our holiday uh, sale is going on right now. So if you are looking for something good to read uh, for your holiday travels or you need that special last minute gift, head over to zero one publishing. We have all of our books, including uh, Ishii's Case File Arkham. Yeah, and there's a discount, huh? And Yep, and World War Kaiju. And there you go. That's where you find it. So, uh, okay. I, I, I guess uh, we'll call it a night. Yeah, thank there, you. There so was one question, though. From yeah. The yeah, William Sova or something? Yes. Oh, William's got a question. Where? Uh, uh, just above Excuse me, me Mr. Is. G. I yes. have a question to ask. I've noticed in a lot of Chinese stories, there's a lot of weird, over-the-top social conflict. And I was curious if your work has that, or do you avoid? Uh, Pretty Shatner-esque. Let's see. Is Cycle of Salt Breaker it actually doesn't come up? Because our heroes don't have time for that kind of the nonsense. They are protectors. They're contractors. They go out to fight bandits and beasts and monsters and terrorists. They don't have time to get caught up in the petty politics like that. So in this story, at least, there's no room for over the top social conflict. Not only that, other characters are professionals. They comport themselves as professionals. If there are disagreements, they sort out like professionals. They don't try to gossip or backbite or influence each other. They don't try to interfere with each other's daily lives either. They work things out and they carry on. In a sense, what I want to do with Saga Star Breakers is actually do the opposite of all this weird over the top social conflict. Because that's just not how things are done at a, at top most levels of well, professional martial artists, warriors, soldiers, and the like. All right. Well, again, uh Kitsun, thank you very much for joining us. It was great talking to you and great yes, to finally meet you. you. Thank you for having me here. And anytime you have something to promote, let us know. We'll bring you on the air again. You mm -hmm. can uh, hopefully uh, get some more people interested. Thank you. Oh, BCG already says he wants to read these. Yes. <laughs> Do Hope it. you enjoy them. So, all right. Want to Good night, and, everyone. Uh, uh, definitely go check out his uh, Kickstarter. Get in on the uh, ground floor while you can. I know Fiona's jumping at the bit to do so. Um, and uh, actually, uh, once uh, the book is officially released after you uh, uh, meet your Kickstarter, uh, we'd love to have you back. Thank All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Or not Kickstarter, Indiegogo. I apologize. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Good night, everybody. And uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes.